Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we continue with the compilation videos which are aimed at people who are working or people who are driving or people who just have a heck of a lot of time and want something on in the background. Today's compilation is Nuclear Revenge. Our first story today comes to us from a deleted account. Crappy customer gets vandalized. Let's jump right in. I work at a restaurant where the employees are overworked and underpaid. Despite this, everyone is cool with each other and management. The evils that mess up our day are the customers and our by-the-book district manager who drops by every now and then. For about three months, we had someone in the men's bathroom come in and smear an ungodly amount of fecal matter all over the handicap stall of the men's bathroom. Even sometimes they'll fling scat outside of the stall onto another toilet or a wall. Of course, management sends one of us peons to clean it up. Fortunately for me, I never had to as I worked the cash register. The one coworker who we'll call Arthur was who I'd call the personification of pettiness. He was crazy and had a smart mouth and an explosive temper when pushed too far. Me and Arthur were cool. I never had problems with him, but management always had him clean out the bathroom when it was poo smeared. One day, Arthur came in on his day off to get some food. After placing his order, he went to use the restroom. While there, he heard someone moan and groan having a massive crap storm in the handicap stall. He didn't think much of it even when he smelled that god-awful scent. An older gentleman around 50 exited the stall. Arthur came out and noticed the smell was even stronger than before. Curious, he peeked into the stall and noticed the poop smears all over the place. Infuriated, he asked the old man if he had done that and why would he even? The old guy said with a crap-eating grin, Look, I don't care. I just want to ruin some poor effer's day. Arthur was set the F off, as he was that poor effer. Initially, Arthur wanted to clock the guy right then and there, but in his own words, time slowed down around him and all he saw was red. Arthur didn't say anything to the man, instead washed his hands and sat back down waiting for his food. He sat on the opposite end of the restaurant, but the location provided an overview of the entire floor. He could see the old guy at his booth munching away like nothing happened. Of course, someone complained that there was poop smeared all over, and one of the other employees that Arthur was cool with had to go clean up the mess. Arthur caught the old guy looking in on the situation and grinning to himself. Seeing that, Arthur thought the man needed to be taught a hard and hurtful lesson. The old guy finished his food and drove home. Little did he know that Arthur was following him. He ends up following old guy to his home and stakes it out for an hour. Arthur does this for a couple of weeks, following him home, learning about this guy as quick as possible. Even on days off, he drove over to where he lived and followed him to both the restaurant and to his, the old guy's company. Arthur had gotten a rough idea of this guy's work and sleep schedule, so it was time to enact his revenge. Going by the information he acquired about the guy's activities and the neighborhood he lived in, Arthur figured out that this guy lived well enough to survive, but had no means of backup if something were to happen. Arthur had a three-part plan for him. First act, in the dead of night, Arthur went to the old guy's house. He slashed one of the tires. The old guy drove a jeep, so Arthur opened the spare tire compartment and poked a small hole in it. The old guy woke up the following morning to find his tire flat. According to Arthur, the old man was on the phone freaking out because he was going to be running late for work and really didn't have the money to get a new tire. Not only that, to Arthur's surprise, the old guy didn't know how to change a tire. The old guy spent nearly two hours in the hot Texas morning heat on the phone with someone on how to put the spare tire on. This is important for later in this act. At this point, Arthur is foaming at the mouth with excitement. The old guy drove on the spare to work only to find out that afternoon that the spare went flat. Even more frustrated, the old man drives the car to a nearby auto shop to get both tires serviced. Later that night, this time Arthur slashed three out of four of his tires. Remember when old guy was on the phone getting instructions on how to get his tire fixed? Well, before that, he had called his car insurance company to get someone to come out and fix his tire. He was very loud, and the gist of the conversation was that the insurance company wouldn't come out and fix his tire, 
and couldn't get them insured because all four tires weren't blown out. They said it would be easier and least expensive to just change the tire himself and get another. So later that night, Arthur slashed the other three tires, save for the new one. Arthur wasn't there that following morning, but he knew that the old guy surely had a meltdown. That, and he didn't show up to the restaurant for a month. Second Act Piggybacking on the first act, Arthur would regularly check on old guy's car. When all the tires were replaced, Arthur went to the old guy's house late at night and poured a gallon and a half of sugar and bleach into the gas tank. His car had one of those manual gas covers instead of the modern button inside the car, so no one was none the wiser. In the morning, during Arthur's stakeouts, the old man started up his car and left for work, only to get halfway there before the car stopped working. So old guy had to get his car towed back to his house. The final act. Arthur got the old guy's name from the phone conversation and searched him on Facebook. He downloaded a couple of good pictures of him and created a few flyers. Due to the old guy's car being unusable, he wasn't able to come into the restaurant to do his usual crap, pun intended. Arthur printed the flyers out and posted them all over the restaurant. The flyers had a picture of the guy, his name, and described what he did in bathrooms for the past few months. A few days later, the old guy comes in with a friend. The friend goes ahead and orders while the old guy runs to the bathroom. One of the co-workers spotted him and notifies everyone there, including the friend. Old guy starts to do his thing in the stall until he sees the flyer with his face on it. He storms out of the bathroom, flyer in hand, angrily demanding for the person responsible to step up to him. Arthur steps up in his uniform and claims responsibility. The old guy begins to threaten to sue for slander and emotional damages and other offenses to which Arthur simply says with an equally crap-eating grin, look, I don't care, I just want to ruin some poor effer's day. Old guy's soul momentarily leaves his body as he realizes that the same guy he confessed his crime two weeks ago was one of the employees. The manager arrives and bans the old guy from the restaurant. Old guy threatens to ram his car into the windows, to which Arthur says, Is your car a unicycle? Better check your tires, you poor effer. Old guy then realizes that Arthur was behind the attacks. Banned from the restaurant, no hard evidence of Arthur's vandalism and extreme embarrassment. Old guy decides to bow out. Haven't seen or heard from him since. Unfortunately, fast forward a month and two nights ago, Arthur got arrested from fighting an off-duty officer at a convenience store. Was anybody else expecting Arthur just to rub some crap all over this guy's house? Maybe all over his car as well? I wasn't expecting him to go anywhere near as far as he did. Also, at the end where we see that Arthur got arrested, it actually doesn't surprise me. Because if he's willing to do that much in retaliation to this guy, he might just not make the best decisions. <laughs> Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Peach Jelly Soda. No proof, no problem. Don't mess with woman's best friend. Let's jump right in. No names because what I did was pretty illegal. I manage a bar and one day I came in to see the place totally ransacked. Thankfully, but weirdly, nothing was stolen, which meant it was someone with a personal vendetta. I had recently fired an employee who I suspected had done it. We hadn't been able to get his keys back yet, so he had a way to get in and knew the alarm codes since he would open the bar sometimes. I went to my office and saw that the lock on the door had been smashed in and the CCTV footage was deleted. The only thing that was missing was a clay mold of my dog's paw print I had taken right before she passed away. This dog was my first pet and was my best friend. I always talked about her and had brought her into the bar a couple of times on my days off. We let pets on the patio. So all the employees knew how much she meant to me. I kept the mold on my desk to always have her with me. I was sure it was him. He hadn't taken his firing so well. But with no absolute proof, I couldn't just outright accuse him. The bar is a bikini bar and the dude was a total creep. On multiple occasions, he had made disgusting comments to the girls. The cherry on top was, he came in drunk and groped the girl working. Men who came in could be gross, but the things he would say and did were on another level altogether. When I called all the employees to ask where they had been, 
he totally outed himself before I could even ask him. He said, I was home with my wife on Saturday night. I just smiled into the phone and said, I never said it happened on Saturday. He quickly hung up. Gotcha, B. The police couldn't do crap though with the camera footage deleted. All I had was him knowing it happened on a Saturday. Plus, the damage wasn't too bad. Just a lot of smashed plates and the lock on the door. So there wouldn't be much to sue him for if I did get proof. So I decided to get even and get my dog's paw print back. He only deleted the night of the break-in, not the rest of the footage, so I combed through hours of footage to find the time he had slapped the girl's butt and grabbed at her chest. But I found something even better. On the camera pointing to the back alley, he was having relations with some chick, probably a prostitute, definitely not his wife, up against his car. This dude was an idiot. He even smiled and waved at the camera. I copied the footage to a USB stick and put it in an envelope. I knew he had another job, so I waited there until he showed up and went inside. I stuck the envelope under his windshield wiper with a note. It read, give back what you stole or this will start popping up everywhere you go. It didn't take long for him to text me. I played dumb and acted like I knew nothing about it, but added, sounds like whatever you took was important to the person. He told me to F off and said he didn't have whatever I thought he took. I still played dumb. The next day, I left another USB in his mailbox. I knew his address from his W-2, and another on his windshield wiper again for good measure. I guessed he found them both because I received another string of texts asking what the F is wrong with me. I still played dumb, but told him to give back whatever the person was asking for, and it would probably stop. He said he didn't have the paw print and was going to the police. Man, this guy was dumb as a bag of rocks. I told him only I knew the paw print was taken, and now I had proof he broke in for the police. No response. I'm no lawyer, but pretty sure what I was doing was just as illegal as him breaking in, if not worse, and he would have had a good case on his hands for blackmail, but he was dumb and probably just wanted it all to go away. Safe to say the next day, one of my bartenders told me that the guy that was fired dropped off his keys and a package for me. In the package was my paw print broken in half with a letter that basically said he was sorry and he didn't mean to break it and was just pissed he got fired and to please stop leaving the video. I debated for a good while if I should send the video to his wife anyways, but I found out she was divorcing him because she had found the one in the mailbox. I honestly think this guy got what he deserved, but in the end, I think he just broke the paw print as a final F you. One thing I keep on going back to in this story though is that the alarm code wasn't changed when this guy was fired. In every single place I've worked at that had an alarm system, if someone got fired, that alarm code was changed pretty much immediately. So while what the employee was doing was illegal, it could have been prevented in the first place if the owner of the establishment had just taken some basic security practices. Our next story today comes to us from In The Hog unjustly fire me? Let me make you go bankrupt real quick. Let's jump right in. I was told to post this here, so here we go. This happened a few years ago and still makes me giggle with glee to this day. I'm a 34-year-old female who has always been a bit of a tomboy. I like cars, sports, and reptiles. When I was 25, I wanted a career change and finally follow my dream of working in an auto repair shop as a painter, like my father always did. To start my education, I needed to already have a job at an auto repair shop as an intern. So I searched and called a lot of companies to see if they had spots. There were literally several companies that laughed at me because there's no place for a woman on the work floor. Disheartened, I tried one final company who said he'd take a chance with me. I was thrilled. I was promised lots of opportunities to learn and a steady job after graduation. I started a week later, and the first two weeks were awesome. I learned a lot and was promised even more opportunities. He promised I would have two to three hours a week of private time with the resident painter for practice. Soon after though, it went downhill. The owner had a bid on a contract with a large city in our country to restore underground containers. I had to sand them down, put sealant on the edges, and prepare them for painting. Tedious work, but I did it diligently. The promised practice time never happened. After a while, all I did day in, day out, eight hours a day, was sand down underground containers. 
By the end of the day, my hands and wrists were numb from the vibrations. This, by the way, is illegal. You're not allowed to sand with a pneumatic sanding machine for more than four hours a day in my country, as it causes severe wrist and hand issues. After several months, the contract with the city ended, and I hoped my promised practice time would come. But no, it didn't. I was given jobs that had nothing to do with my education. I was told to do jobs that a contractor should do, like put rebar in front of the windows, repair the sliding doors, repair walls and other small things, basically nothing to do with my desire to become a painter. After six months of doing literally nothing that I could count towards my education, my boss called me into his office. He told me he was fed up with my attitude, he made a mistake hiring me, I was fired on the spot. I was heartbroken and cried the whole way home. I didn't get it. I put 110% into my job, working hard, always on time, staying late if needed, and never complained. I didn't understand what happened, and was pretty down for a while. However, several days later I found out I was pregnant, which helped me get over my downness. We had been trying for over a year, so we were ecstatic. When the time came that my final paycheck should come in, nothing happened. A week after it normally came in, I called but was told to not complain and it would be transferred shortly. Two weeks later, still nothing. Called again and got a very irate boss on the line, cussing at me and calling me things I will not repeat here. I was fed up and contacted my lawyer. Here comes the revenge part. Ha ha ha. In my country, there's apparently a few laws that my boss broke without me even knowing about them. First, you're not allowed to fire somebody without reasonable cause. You need to document bad behavior and give the employee a write-up. After two write-ups, you're allowed to terminate. My boss never did this. Unlawful termination can end in a fine, and the employee has a right to get as many monthly pays as the employment contract would have continued if the employee wasn't terminated, which would mean I had a right to another six months of pay. Second, you must pay the final paycheck within a week of termination. We were now going on week four. After the first week, an employee is entitled to compensation of up to 100 euros per day of not receiving their paycheck, meaning I was now entitled to at least 2,100 euros extra pay. My lawyer wrote up a letter to my boss stating we would be pursuing my legal rights. He didn't respond. A week later, we sent another letter increasing the compensation for late payment as we went. Another month of my lawyer not getting any response. Suddenly, I received my pay. No compensation, nothing, just basic pay. My lawyer recommended to go to small claims court, and so we did. Mind you, it takes about three months before you can appear before the court. He didn't even show up in court, but sent a statement through his lawyer saying how I was a horrible employee, blah, blah, blah. However, he had no proof whatsoever, but I did. I had my performance reports from one month into employment, and four months into employment, and they were stellar. The judge saw right through my boss's BS and awarded me six months of pay, 12,000 euros, four months of late payment compensation. This is because he didn't pay the full amount my lawyer requested, as was my legal right, about 12,000 euros. Legal fees, now about 3,000 euros. I was paid the same week. He was then also charged with a fine for violating employment laws, he had to pay 50,000 euros. This resulted in the Employment Bureau, this agency makes sure companies comply with employment laws, etc., investigating the company. They discovered the building I worked at was unsafe. The foundation was unstable, walls were crumbling and tilting. He was told to make repairs or they would close them down within a month. By accident, they discovered he was also cheating on his taxes. So, the tax agency got involved. He got charged with embezzlement and tax invasion for both of his companies. He had to pay back all taxes he evaded, plus a 100% fine, coming to a staggering 250,000 euros over several years. He didn't have that kind of money, and after struggling for about two months, which resulted in him not paying his other employees, he went belly up. Both businesses shut down, and the building I worked at even got demolished. Seven years later, it's still an empty plot, and if I ever feel put down by somebody, I take a short drive to that place, and it reminds me, people will sometimes get what they deserve.
I love a good story of people fighting for what they're owed and actually getting it. This one had the added benefit of the person getting taken down completely and absolutely utterly destroyed. Such is the way in Nuclear Revenge. Our next story today comes to us from Raven's Arts. Crazy entitled neighbor tries to bleach my sister's cat. Cat gets revenge. Let's jump right in. I count this as a nuclear revenge story, but not in the traditional sense. This happened many years ago. My older sister had this awful bee of a neighbor who had a serious hate on for Sis's seal point Siamese cat. Crazy neighbor was a black haired plump 40 something divorcee who annoyed everyone in the neighborhood. She had zero understanding of boundaries and liked to come over to people's homes, barge in and look around, opening drawers and cabinets and touching their stuff. Once, she even went into someone's fridge and grabbed herself a ginger ale, then got mad when the homeowner took it back. If you left your door, front or back unlocked for more than 10 minutes, chances were she'd just come right in. She stole yard decorations from other people's yards and had been caught on more than one occasion pocketing something she'd snagged off a mantle or table of a house she'd invaded, and she would always throw a tantrum when she got busted. Cops have been called on her many times, but she was good at being pathetic, so most people didn't press charges. Unfortunately, this made her bolder. Basically, she was the entitled bee of the neighborhood. Sis was, unfortunately, one of her favorite victims. She'd come over without calling, barge her way in, and ask, demand, to see Sis's cat, telling Sis how beautiful he was and how much she wanted a cat just like him. Sis, being rather non-confrontational, would let her see the cat, who didn't like the woman, then make her leave. Crazy neighbor never wanted to leave and had to basically be pushed out the door. Oh, and she despised me because I wouldn't let her in when I answered the door, nor would I tolerate her BS in any way if she got past my sister. Crazy Neighbor was so obsessed with the cat and offered to buy him many times. But Sis loved that cat. He'd been the runt of the litter and rejected by his mom. My sister had taken him and bottle fed him, mothered him, and saved his life. He wasn't a pet, he was her child. So Sis of course always said no. This royally pissed off Crazy Neighbor. One day the cat got out, he wasn't an outdoor cat. So Sis and I immediately started looking for him. We were checking the bushes and behind the flower pots in her backyard when we heard a very distinctive yowl, one of pure rage followed by a very human shriek of pain coming from Crazy Neighbor's house. Suddenly the doggy door on Crazy Neighbor's back door slams open and out runs my sister's cat, his tail and one rear paw covered in what smelled like hair bleach. I'm allergic to bleach and immediately recognize the smell as he passed me, dashing past us and into Sis's house. Next thing you know, crazy neighbor's back door slams open and out she comes, cursing up a blue streak. Ragged claw marks adorned her left cheek and one of her hands had a deep bite wound that had completely saturated one of the gloves, the kind one gets with a hair coloring kit. She was wearing and running down her hand and arm. Turned out when the cat had gotten out, Crazy neighbor had grabbed him, took him inside, then tried to use hair bleach to bleach out the brown out of his tail and paws in order to change his appearance so she could keep him. Unfortunately for her, she didn't know crap about Siamese cats and just how violent they can be. They were originally temple guardians for a reason. The moment crazy neighbor put that bleach on that cat's tail, he went absolutely berserk, letting out that yowl of rage we'd heard, clawing up crazy neighbor's face and sinking his fangs deep into her hand. She pulled herself between the bushes, the ones that looked like tall green paintbrush heads, Sis used to separate the property line, and began yelling. No, not yelling, shrieking. She shrieked that Sis's cat had wandered into her kitchen while she was cooking, and when she tried to pick him up, he attacked her for no reason. Clearly, this was total BS. Crazy Neighbor then proceeded to call Sis the N-word several times, she's half black, and me an effing half-breed, I'm half Hispanic, we have different dads. She screamed that my Sis was stupid for keeping such a dangerous animal, and that my Sis would be paying all her medical bills. She then got right in my sister's face, pushed my sister hard in the chest with her uninjured hand, saying she was calling animal control and intended to have that thing put down. 
crazy neighbor opened her mouth to shriek some more, but my sis, after hearing that last statement, and without one word or warning, hauled off and decked her. She landed on her butt in the grass, now clutching her left eye. Sis then loudly suggested crazy neighbor go screw herself with a hot curling iron, then ran inside to find her poor cat while I called the cops. The whole thing from start to end lasted only about five minutes. Sis found him hiding in the laundry room and quickly cleaned him off in the sink. Meanwhile, crazy neighbor is still on her butt in our backyard, howling like a banshee until the cops arrived. I told them what happened and they later talked to my sister, after she tended to her cat, who gave them the same story I did, even admitting to hitting crazy neighbor. In self-defense, of course. It didn't hurt her case that crazy neighbor had left a bloody handprint on my sister's shirt when she'd shoved her. Crazy neighbor, of course, told them something entirely different. Her story was that she was about to bleach her hair when my sister's cat came in and attacked her. She also said both sis and I attacked her too. I apparently kicked her in the stomach after sis punched her, but the cops found no evidence of bruising, and the scratches on her face kind of masked her swelling eye. I also think the cops turned a blind eye, pun intended to it, considering the circumstances, but since there was a clear blood trail leading to Crazy Neighbor's open back door, cops felt they had probable cause to go in. I think if Crazy Neighbor had been paying more attention, she'd have refused them entry. The blood trail led to a sink in the first floor bathroom. Blood, cat fur, a bleach applicator, and the box it came in were in the sink and on the floor. The cat's collar was in the garbage. Crazy Neighbor kept trying to play the victim, but the cops didn't buy it. She got arrested, and my sister pressed charges for theft and assault. Crazy Neighbor also got nabbed for possession of stolen goods. Cops found a bunch of DVD players and CD players still in their boxes, sitting on her coffee table and in the spare room next to her bathroom. And she had a bunch of prescription drug bottles with other people's names on them on her kitchen counter. Turned out, she'd also been stealing neighbors' painkillers when she'd visited them. And, since she was a renter, the property owner gave her the boot for breach of contract. She went to jail and had to pay for the cat's vet bill. He was okay, but a bit traumatized, and had a yellow patch on his butt, paw, and tail for several months. Crazy Neighbor's hand got infected from the cat bite, and it turns out it had also caused tendon and nerve damage as well. Moral of the story, stay out of people's houses and have the common sense not to mess with a cat named Lucifer. I know this story's about a cat, but I want to go back to the point where this neighbor was going into houses all over the place, taking things, and they were focusing on OP's sister. Now, you've all seen the movie Home Alone, right? Because this seems to me like a perfect opportunity to do a whole bunch of booby traps inside your house just to see what happens to that wonderful neighbor. Our next story today comes to us from I'm Sick of Your Crap. Grandpa gave up what time he had left for revenge on my behalf. Let's jump right in. This is a throwaway account for obvious reasons. This story has a few references to some triggering things, just FYI. Now, I've been debating over posting this or not, but have finally decided I will. This is my grandpa's nuclear revenge on my behalf. So I guess, let's begin, it's going to be a long story. I grew up dealing with a lot of mental health issues, as my mother is a drug addict, and my father liked to ignore my existence, as I'm the result of a one-night stand while he was married. So, needless to say, his wife hated me, and their children treated me horribly as well. The only good people I had in my life were my grandma and my grandpa on my father's side. I loved them and spent a lot of time at my grandpa's business. I'll explain that a little later. Now, at 14, everything went further downhill. I won't go into details, but my mother almost passed away, and I met a man, let's call him Goat, he looked like one. Long story short, Goat was 25 at the beginning, and emotionally, physically, and sexually abused me. While I was under the prescient that I loved him and it was okay. He pushed me away from my grandparents and isolated me for two years until a friend helped me get out of it. During this next year, Goat stalked me threatened me, and had me absolutely terrified. I was afraid of going to the police as I didn't want to bring harsh light to my grandpa's business, and because I was afraid. I was staying at my friend's house for a while during this time, as my panic attacks and what I now know as PTSD was horrible, and I hated to be alone. During this time, my grandmother passed away, one of the only lights in my life left, so I became worse. 
I began drinking and going to parties and trying to forget my life. Right before my 18th birthday, Goat made a real life appearance again. On my way back from a big party, he jumped me, beat me black and blue, and almost killed me. I was found and taken to hospital, where they began treating me, and as I was underage, they asked me to call an adult in my life that they could talk to. I tried to call my father, but he didn't pick up. Knowing my mother wasn't going to help, I had to call my grandfather. He was at the hospital in lightning speed, and for the first time in my life, I watched this man that had built his own empire really break down. Even at my grandma's funeral, he didn't cry. I spent two months in the hospital with police questioning me and my grandpa by my side every day. During this time, he met my friend who helped me out of it all at the beginning and became very close to him. My grandfather helped me get on my feet for a whole year until one day he had a large family gathering and socialized the whole time. Taking me with him, that night I will never forget. We went to get ice cream and then he just hugged me for a very long time, holding me tight and reassuring me everything would be okay. The next day, my grandpa exacted his revenge. Now, my grandpa was the owner of a well-off law firm that also had private detectives in a smaller office in his building. He apparently tracked down Goat and went about his revenge. My grandpa shot Goat three times in the stomach and once in the chest. Goat passed away in the hospital later that day while my grandpa was taken in and soon put in jail for manslaughter, which he pleaded guilty to. I never got the chance to visit my grandpa in jail as he passed away soon after in jail from complications. One week after my grandpa's death, I got a call from his solicitor, and he asked me to go in. I was met with a lengthy letter from my grandpa, which was nothing but loving and showed that he had found out he had terminal lung cancer and wouldn't live much longer. But he couldn't happily leave me alone in this world without Goat being gone too. My grandpa left almost everything to me. At 20, I would inherit the law firm and could do as I pleased with it, and I inherited 95% of his savings his house he lived in with grandma, and his other assets. In case anyone's interested, I turned 21 last week. I'm currently working at the law firm. My grandpa's secretary, now the CEO, has taken over the important things in the building and makes most of the decisions. I spent half the money I was given in locked savings funds for all of the younger family members to go to college when it's time. I cut all contact off with my father, who tried to steal money from me during the death arrangements of grandpa. My friend mentioned earlier in the story is now my fiance and we're getting married next summer. I'm still suffering from PTSD and depression, but it's getting better every day. I'm in therapy for my PTSD's treatment. I got a tattoo for my grandpa and my grandma on my back of two lions protecting a cub. I also opened up a safe house for anyone going through abuse of any kind. No matter the race, gender or age, I'm trying to help anyone I can in that situation. Besides for what I've put away for later in life, I'm also thinking of opening up the bakery I always wanted and employing the people that need the job and help the most, but I am unsure at the moment about that. My grandpa and grandma was a godsend, and to this day, I miss them greatly, but I know I couldn't have changed the stubborn old man's mind even if I tried. While I definitely don't condone grandpa's actions, I understand them completely. He was already on his way out, and he thought he could make the world a better place for you. OP, your grandpa's a badass. I know you're doing a bunch of things with grandpa's money for other people, but OP, remember yourself. Make sure you put enough away to keep yourself comfortable going through life. Our next story today comes to us from Drumhead. Entitled Ladies Porsche Loses Tires. Let's jump right in. Okay, so this story took place back when I was in Florida in the early 90s. It does involve an act of vandalism that is connected to revenge. Hopefully, it won't be removed, and hopefully it will count as nuclear revenge. Anyway, South Florida was devastated by Hurricane Andrew. My dad, as part of a local charity, was set up day after day at a local market, seeking donations from shoppers to give to food banks. You have to understand this storm left many people homeless, and without power in some cases, for six plus months in Florida heat and humidity. My father was legally disabled from a serious car accident. He was hit by a drunk driver in the early 80s and suffered from relentless hip and back problems. It never killed his heart or kindness to others, hence the charity work. 
One day, he was about to pull into the disabled space at the local market to go buy a few items to donate to the hurricane charity. Right before he's about to pull in, this lady pulls into the space in this shiny red Porsche. My dad parks behind her and says, Excuse me, ma'am, I was about to pull in there, and also points to his disabled placard in the window. She says to him, you don't look disabled, and proceeded to walk into the store. For anyone who has a relative who uses a disabled space, you know the frustration of this situation and the anger one feels. My dad, seemingly unfazed, waits until she goes into the store and then gets out and snips the valve stems on all four tires, flattening but not destroying all of them. He then pulls into another space not far away and just waits. About 15 minutes later, the lady comes out and is shrieking about her car being vandalized. My dad is far enough away so she can't see him, but he can hear everything. She calls the police. Big mistake. She files a report for vandalism, and the police give her a ticket for being parked in the disabled space with no placard, about $250 at the time. The cop leaves, and she calls a tow truck. As the car is being loaded onto the truck, my dad pulls up and says to her, you don't look disabled, but your car sure is, and then drives off. My dad could be a nice guy and pure savage when he needed to be. Savage indeed. Again, I don't condone their actions, but oh my gosh, it had to be amazing seeing that woman's reaction when she walked back out to her precious Porsche. <laughs> Our next story today comes to us from Throwaway 2021 1250. He scoffed at me, so I got him fired and sent back to his country. Let's jump right in. So let me preface this by saying I do feel somewhat bad about the events that transpired, but it would be eating my conscience to say I didn't do it on purpose because I did. I started my first full-time job when I was 20, fresh off college and ready to take on the world. I resided in a Middle Eastern country where people got brought in frequently by employers and one mistake could cost them everything. I was outside this because I was a resident of the place despite not being from there. Anyways, when I first started, I got along very well with my coworker, despite the fact that he came off as a lot of bad things for me. We tried hanging out, but the more I got to know him, the more disgusted I became. He was sexist, a purist of his religion, where he believes execution of certain people should be allowed, and he was extremely homophobic. But nonetheless, I tried making friends with him because I was open to anything. In our office, we have a portable Wi-Fi that he took with him every day, free internet. And I never commented on this because I have my own. I can't afford it, and so can he. More on this later. The closer I got to him, the more he opened up, but in the worst ways. He would send me lewd images while we're in the office of women, talk about drug use, and sometimes disappear from work for hours on end while I man the office. Like I said, I was 20, I was still young and naive, and I tried my best to seem calm and friendly. I wanted to make an impression. This man, however, was the opposite. He was several years older than me and acted like he was above me through every step. But I ignored it because I wanted to be civil. Sometimes I would help him with his work until eventually his work became mine. He would just expect me to do it without even lending a hand. I didn't say anything, I just did it. His being missing from the office became more frequent. Sometimes he would only be at work for a measly two hours out of nine hours, popping in and out, and the office manager is too chicken crap to say anything to the general manager. Then there's the lateness, where I would come in on time every day, and he'd come in an hour late. Still, I kept my mouth shut. It escalated to him adjusting attendance records, so it seems like he's not absent even though his absences were frequent. Unfortunately, he was put in charge of that too. I remained quiet throughout all of this. I remained civil, until finally, I spoke to the general manager about pursuing a different line of work. I was always into graphic design, and they needed to get some work done, so I offered to do it. But during this time, I couldn't afford much things anymore because I had to help pay for bills for my parents. So I usually just walked to work back and forth every day and limited my eating to once a day, meaning the Wi-Fi was no longer something I could afford. So as an agreement, I could take the office Wi-Fi with me and work on designs from home. However, my coworker didn't agree to this and pretty much attacked me with a barrage of insults. 
He scoffed at the fact that I needed the Wi-Fi to do design work and said I was a joke. I suppressed majority of what the conversation held, but it went something like this. I just need it tonight. You can have the Wi-Fi tomorrow. Why? It's not yours. I need to do some design work. Yeah, me too. I need to do that too, so leave it here. I couldn't remember much of what else he said, but there was a scoff after he said that, and he made fun that my design sucked and that I should just stop while I'm ahead. My blood boiled and I reached a point of no return. I immediately phoned the office manager and talked about the situation and how if I don't get the Wi-Fi, I'll complain to the general manager who did in fact give me his blessing unlike this turd. He immediately called my coworker and told him to give me the Wi-Fi, which he did, and that was that. Except I'm a petty person, and I'm not about to let some butthole get off with a slap on the wrist. The next day, I went to the head office and had a meeting with the general manager. I spoke to him about all the misconducts this guy had, how he's always late, never in the office, changes his absences, steals money sometimes, etc. I spilled my heart out on all his wrongdoings, showing the messages and photos I was sent during shift that I never asked for, and how I'm doing all of his work. It escalated to a point where he got brought into the main office for a meeting, where I proceeded to berate him in front of the manager, and he could only try to defend himself, but I was prepared. It turns out, the office manager never even spoke to the general manager about his misconduct. Afterwards, he was brought back to the office, having been yelled at by both my and the general manager. And I could say that's where it ends, except it's not. After he left, the general manager realized if I had been doing all the work, then why didn't I say anything? I responded that I was simply there to work and to help. However, with what just happened and the fact that this guy was getting paid more than me, I've decided that if he's here, then I won't be staying in the company. I gave him a choice, me or this guy. The answer was obvious because by the next day, he was handed a termination letter and another letter that states he's been booked a ticket and he has to head back to his home country within a month. And he's barred from entering the country for several years due to his public misconduct that was reported by a certain someone to the local authorities. I could say that's the end, but okay, this is the last one I swear. See, he had a girlfriend back home, a fiancé more like, whom he has been cheating on. Funny enough, he added me on Facebook when we first met, and she proceeded to add me too, because he talks about me to her. Well, our messages weren't just inappropriate. It showed details of him cheating on her, with me questioning him if that's a good idea. Every screenshot sent. All the photos of the woman he's been with sent. She was livid and I kept apologizing for keeping her in the dark, but that I thought she deserved to know at least. I haven't spoken to her since, but judging from the fact that her Facebook status no longer states she's engaged to him is enough of a confirmation. I sent him one last thing before blocking him on every social media we've been connected in. You deserve this, craphead. It's been several months since then, and I'm thriving at work. I got a raise, I have better coworkers, and I'm getting a promotion. As for him, well, he's out there somewhere in the world, who knows, and who cares, right? We're no longer in the same country, so whatever else happens to him no longer phases me. Though, he did once send me a photo of his fake Italian ID because he was planning on illegally migrating there next year. I'm on the fence if I should send it to the authorities in Italy or not, just as a precaution. I might consider migrating there at some point. OP, I don't think you should do anything about the ID right away. What you should do is make a fake profile for a female and friend him on it. And then, if he moves to Italy, alert the authorities after he moves there and include his location. That would be the ultimate revenge. Our next story today comes to us from Brooke Hall. Try to end my life? Become homeless, B. Let's jump right in. To be blunt about this, I don't know what r slash this fits in. It's revenge, but I don't know if it's petty, nuclear, or what, or if it even fits in entitled parents, but I picked here, and I might, did, it was in petty first, cross post it if it doesn't fit. Not saying we all have any, but I personally have a terrible mother. So bad, she's been in the local newspaper for being a prick twice. Some might blame this all on the fact that she's a drug addict, but even when she wasn't, when it was clear she wasn't on drugs, she was a C and a slippery little one too. 
So you get that she's a bee, but let's go back to the beginning. The way beginning of her being one. I was 8 or 9, maybe I needed to be punished, I don't remember or care, and she sent me to the corner. I felt whatever I did she could live with, and I guess that was my mistake, and I did pay for it. She was yelling at me when I wasn't in the corner and shaking me. I didn't want her touching, so I resisted. This made her mad, so she picked me up and threw me. A young kid that probably accidentally broke a lamp or took a quarter from a jar she had hidden at a wall leaving a crater and probably giving me a concussion. Effing heck. Flash forward to when I'm 13 and when a lot of this next crap happens in which I'll boil the worst parts down. We move to a city with cool lift locks, decent secondhand game shops, antique stores, and a junior hockey team called the Pete's. We live in an apartment, and the jackbutt mother meets an impressionable man around her age. We all go, he's not bad, and allow him into our lives. I found out they, not only then, but she was a drug addict before, are doing heroin and crap. She has asked me to throw out the garbage, and only later I realized the needles sticking out that could possibly kill me are drug needles. She got in literal knife fights with this man she was seeing, making me walk my young sister to my aunt's because their problems affecting us. She lost the place when I was 14, putting us in a woman's shelter with a nice park beside it. Irresponsibly, she had prescribed medication and took four times the recommended amount right in front of the staff, making the staff worried for us and her. So she's rushed to the hospital and my sister is placed in foster care with my aunt and the same for me and my other aunt. Half a year later, the bee attempts suicide and failed because a cop caught her and saved her. This'll sound morbid, but I wanted him to not find her, but you'll know why soon enough. This attracted pity, and later, my aunt wanted me to pick either foster care or going back with her. I only picked her because everyone else said she deserved someone. Cut to D months, it's been a year, only minor crap happened, but then my grandfather had a failed chemo thing, don't know what happened exactly, but he faded fast, rest in peace, and everyone visited him at my aunt's house for his final days. Not a week in, my mother finds a drug dealer, might have been a drunk too, gets high and tries to make me get in her car with her. Knowing this was F, I resist. She gets angry and drags me screaming. She falls and crushed a cousin who was sleeping nearby and gets herself arrested because nobody who woke up would let her take me while my younger cousins cried. And ironically, she's the one who called them. Grandpa passes, but because she was a bee, she went back home when she was released from the police and only showed up to the funeral being a mess. I am forced to go home with her, but over the next two months, I get tired of this drug addict BS and make an attempt to leave. But get this, she tries to effing kill me with a hammer. No joke, no hyperbole, this woman does that. I bring in the hammer to the police literally moments after this, but because there's no blood, due to impressive struggling by me and me being young, the bee says this line, No, no I didn't. He is young and he doesn't know what he's saying. They almost buy this and ask if I had anywhere else to stay, and I said no, so they don't know what to do and let her off the hook. Now for the revenge. I leave the next night and she never sees me again. I grab the valuable stuff when she leaves for something and break her TV purposely. I catch sight of her at a beer festival I was waiting through, but she's too drunk and dumb to notice me, and that's the last I saw of her. I found out she only had the place we got because she got child tax benefit, which allowed her money for a kid she had, which she didn't because this was two months later I found this out. I then got it cut off and found out a couple months further she lost the place and became homeless and was never allowed access to the woman's shelter, making her really effed as she would only visit my sister and some others. I've slowly gotten better, left that city so she never gets the chance to see her son again, and my life is okay. This was almost two years ago. In this two years ago, she tried to sick my dad on me, another homeless person, but with rich parents allowing him a little access to stuff, he tried to add me on Facebook. I blocked this. I find she's bothering my sister and tell my poor sister to not say crap. Later, she's bothered and asks me how to get rid of her, and I make her block her on every site and tell her not to let her in her place. Recently, that boyfriend she was with, the drug guy, died of a carfentanil overdose, and she's alone. OP, I hope you stay strong. I hope you find somebody to help you get through life, and I hope that you have absolutely no contact with that woman.
Now, I picked up on something interesting in this story because OP mentioned the hockey team called the Peets. Well, I know where that town is, and it's about an hour and a half from where I live. Crazy that one of these is so close by. However, this is a story that we originally covered on the channel back in July of 2019 when the channel sounded and looked like this. Hey everybody, Rob from Karma Comic Chameleon coming at you with a story that was too good for pro revenge. Yeah, sounds kind of horrible, right? But these days we have a much better mic. There's about 70,000 new people here since this was posted, and I just want to do it again. So here we go. Our story today comes to us from Seal Sean, found my girlfriend cheating on me with my close friend. I have him arrested and ghosted her. Let's jump right in. So I am a longtime Redditor and decided to tell you all a story that has only just come to its final conclusion. I have created a secondary Reddit account specifically for this, as I want to protect those that are not a part of the Reddit community and change the names of all involved. Originally posted at r slash pro revenge, but was asked to post it here instead due to the nature of one of the revenge acts. Apologies if there's any spelling or grammar mistakes, hold on to your hats, this is going to be a long one. Backstory, incoming sadness. My wife Rachel and I grew up in a largish town of close to 30,000 people. We knew each other at an early age, roughly six or seven, can't specifically remember. We were practically inseparable. At 16, we started dating each other. When we turned 18, we moved away for work in a city just a few hours drive away. By 20, we were married and had bought our first house. At 22, we discovered that she was pregnant with a boy. It was then disaster struck. About five weeks before she was due to go on maternity leave, a large shelving unit collapsed and crushed her. I was told that both her and our child were killed instantly. Two of her colleagues had also been injured in the accident, one left paralyzed, the other losing his leg after it had to be amputated. The company she was working for had in a cost-cutting measure decided to continue using old shelving that had been written off as unsafe instead of replacing it. I still haven't quite forgiven those executives and management personnel that made that decision because they cut short the love of my life as well as killing our unborn child. It wasn't long after I was told I had a choice on how to proceed with what her company called compensation, but I called it blood money. They wanted to settle out of court to avoid a lawsuit. I, on the other hand, was out for their blood. Just to clarify here, this is not the revenge. This is still backstory. Fortunately, due to the coverage that it got and involving several politicians, the case was settled quickly in court, roughly three years, in which the payout for all parties was close to 10 times the amount that they had initially offered. A lot of fines were given to them for breaches on work, health and safety, executives were sacked, others were jailed, etc. A story for another time maybe when I feel comfortable sharing. In this time, I was still working my job in telecommunications. My mother, bless her soul, had moved in while all this was happening to help me. I think I would have fallen apart if she hadn't been as involved as she was. It was around this time, I was offered a promotion, but it involved a lot of travel around the state. I made a request to have an office in my hometown's branch as I wanted to not only take care of businesses in the state, but in my hometown also as there was no business representative located there to which they agreed. After a few months, we settled into a routine of one to two weeks in the city office, one week in my hometown, and one to two weeks visiting the rest of the state. After a year, I decided to buy a house in my hometown, so I wasn't having to stay at my parents' place every week, or so that I was home and that I could come and go as I pleased. This is important for later in the story. It is about four years later that our story begins. Sorry if the backstory was a bit long. I had just returned from one of my trips on Friday and was checking in some stuff at my office when Harry, the branch's managing director, walked in. We had grown up together also, but had gone to different schools, but since coming back had developed a very close friendship. He asked how things were and then asked me if I wanted to come to a house party that he was having that evening. Short notice and all, but I said yes. I felt a few drinks with friends were in order. It was there that Harry introduced me to Catherine, she was a new hire at the branch where my hometown's office was located and was getting to know everyone being new in town. We hit it off immediately. As much of a cliche as it sounds, it was almost as if Rachel was in front of me instead of Catherine. I won't bore you too much with the details, but after two years of dating, we decided to take the next step and she moved into my hometown's house. Everything up to this point had been going really well. 
Catherine and my parents got along, and Rachel's parents also approved and were happy that someone could make me just as happy as Rachel had done. All was going well for close to a year when things began to change. Skype sessions were cut short suddenly, neighbors would tell me about how a car, described to me like it was Harry's, was always seen parked in the back alley near my house whenever I was away. Some clothes that weren't mine were in my wardrobe. All signs pointed to her cheating, but she said that nothing was happening. She said that Harry would come over occasionally to discuss business, etc., but never stayed the night. I chalked it up to me being paranoid and continued on as if nothing was wrong, but there was always this feeling that something wasn't right. It was close to six months after that I discovered that she had been lying to me. I had just finished closing a rather large contract with a new company and negotiations had wrapped up earlier than I had anticipated. So instead of sticking around for the next few days, I decided to pay for an early flight home and surprise everyone. Fast forward a few hours and I drive into my hometown and down the alley behind my house so that I could get into the house without being seen and surprise Catherine. Some part of me was curious, however, as to whether this mystery car was there. Sure enough, there was a car that was blocking the back entrance gate. I was confused for a moment, wondering if it had been a neglectful neighbor parking, only to realize that it was indeed Harry's car. If it hadn't been for the high hedge line that I had put in a few years back for privacy, I may have well driven past my own place. Pulling up behind his car, I got out and thought it was strange that he was there so late, as she claimed that he had always left by now. As I approached the back of the house, I saw something that made my stomach drop. In my kitchen, Catherine and Harry were going at it hammer and tong. I froze. Time stopped. There was my close friend getting it on on my kitchen bench with my girlfriend. I didn't know what to do. So many questions were running through my head. Was this real or was I dreaming? Were they getting it on in my house? Feeling defeated, I turned and left without them seeing me. I sat in my car for what felt like an eternity. I was crying, hard, but the sadness quickly turned into anger. The same kind of anger I felt towards those that were responsible for Rachel's death. I wanted to hurt them badly. As a pacifist, I don't believe in violence. It was then I knew I was going to punish them and destroy their lives. And what better time to start than now? I moved my car back up the alley, far enough away from my driveway that I could still see Harry's car, and then walked back to the gate where I could see into the house and called her phone. They were still going at it when it rang. They both looked at the caller ID and did a double take when my name came up. I could see that she was considering answering it and they let it ring out. After a few moments, they were back into it again and I dialed once again. This time she did answer. As she was answering, I hung up and made my way back to my car. As soon as I did, she called me back. She asked why I was calling as late as I was. I told her that I was about 10 minutes from home and didn't want to scare her coming in. She obviously was shocked and acted happy that I was coming, and the call ended very quickly after she said she was going to get up and get changed into something. I said bye and hung up. A few moments later, Harry came peeling through the gate and still half naked, jumped into his car, and took off like a bat out of hell. I smiled a little, knowing the fear that both of them would be feeling from being so close to being caught. I waited a few moments before turning my car into the same place Harry had been moments earlier. The night was fairly uneventful afterwards, and it wasn't until after she was asleep that I got up and went to my office down the hall. I couldn't sleep. I needed to plan, and plan I did. The Revenge my mother always taught me to be a pacifist and to allow cosmic karma to take its course. But on this occasion, I decided that karma could use a helping hand. I decided to punish them separately, but destroy both of them. I knew that Harry had a drug habit, nothing major, but he kept it very private. I only knew about it accidentally after seeing some coke and weed left out in his place, but I pretended I hadn't seen it when he made attempts to cover it up. I began calling some of my more unsavory clientele and made a few discreet inquiries into obtaining some samples that they were willing to part with. A few days later, I had a decent enough stash for my plan to work. About a month later, I had friends, including Harry, around for a barbecue night. After making sure that I sufficiently liquored up Harry, I told him to stay the night and sleep it off. In the early hours of that morning, I took the drugs and an assortment of my personal belongings and placed them at various places around his car, with the biggest stash in his tire well. 
Confident that he wouldn't find them over the few months as the rest of my plan took effect, I locked the car up and went inside to sleep. I also placed some more drugs and personal items in his house after driving him home because he was still too drunk to drive. A few days later, I staged a break-in by smashing the back pane of my back door into my kitchen and leaving it open before heading back to the city for a flight. I had several messages the moment I landed, one from my clearly panicked mom who had found the back door smashed open and had called the police, one from Catherine in tears, and one from the local police asking me to call. After returning all the calls, I informed the police I was away on business and that I would be back the following week to talk with them. While away, I got Catherine to stay with my parents until after I got back and asked my dad to organize one of the local security companies to install cameras and an alarm system after getting the go-ahead from the police as to not ruin the scene of the crime. After getting home, I did the usual, my god I can't believe this happened, and why would anyone do this routine. After doing a thorough check of everywhere, finding the items that I had taken that were missing, and filing a police report. I had the security company's rep talk Catherine and I through how the cameras and alarm system worked. Then came the question I had been waiting for, the question of what happens if we're doing some business and don't want it recorded? She acted a bit shy asking this question, but I knew exactly the reason she was asking. He assured us this was a question he got asked a lot, and we were shown on the home computer if we wanted to be doing things without it being recorded, how to stop the recording for certain cameras, so that we could protect her modesty. As I was walking him out, I asked him if the cameras were turned off, could a notification be sent out just as a security precaution? He came back in and helped me through how to set up email notifications and left shortly after. Fantastic. All I had to do was wait. At this stage, I approached r slash legal advice for some help in relation to couples law in my country. I needed to make sure that my upcoming plan could legally be done and that I would not be forced to pay out any money or equity to Catherine, as I didn't know if we were classified as de facto couple or not. Being the sole benefactor of Rachel's estate, I didn't want to be left with any nasty surprises where Catherine could take any of the estate away from me. Shout out to those guys and gals there as they helped me get in contact with a great lawyer who assured me due to the fact that although we had been dating for close to four years, we had not been living together long enough to be classified as de facto. And because I was paying all the utilities on the property that she was living in and didn't pay rent showed that she had no legal standing to make a financial claim against me. Just to be sure though, he drew up what I felt was a pretty ironclad document just in case there was any legal trouble. The following week, my work had approached me and offered me a promotion to move back to the city and run the team that I was a part of, meaning I wouldn't need to travel as often and be in the one location and due to the success of being located in my hometown that they were considering having three to five representatives spend one to two weeks in the larger surrounding towns, including my hometown, as part of my team. I said yes and began the process of beginning my transfer, which would take about six weeks, Perfect, more than enough time to gather all my evidence. Upon getting back to my hometown the following week, I began to start in motion the rest of my plan. I asked Harry to approve one week's worth of vacation for Catherine for two weeks' time. I wanted to send her and a friend or two away on a retreat before I made the biggest decision of my life for a second time. He jumped up and gave me a huge hug, congratulating me on being prepared to take the leap again. I hugged him back tight, but not the way I think he imagined it at the time. He agreed and blocked out the week for me. I asked him not to say anything to anyone, as I wanted to make it as big a surprise as I could. I knew that it would spread like wildfire around the office regardless, but that was my plan. That night, I told Catherine that I had booked her and two friends to go to a tropical spa resort. All expenses paid for a week. No questions asked, pick two friends, and come back to the biggest surprise of her life. She screamed like a kid who had just been told that all the candy in the shop was hers to have. I then told her that the following week, I was going to spend it in the city preparing for a large client who was one of my biggest accounts and needed some people in my team to help before flying out the following week. And I wouldn't be home until the Monday that she was leaving, so I wouldn't be able to see her, which seemed to disappoint her, but I told her it would be worth it when she returned. 
what I failed to tell her was that I had decided to take two weeks vacation on either side of the country, mentally preparing myself for the crap storm that was about to erupt the moment she stepped foot on the plane, as well as enjoying my first stage of freedom. On Sunday, two weeks later, I flew back and began driving home. Once getting there, I'd done a quick pass by my house, and sure enough, Harry's car was there. Like the first night I had caught them, I parked a little ways back and checked the cameras, asleep in my bed. No surprise, honestly, as I had recorded them constantly doing this over the two weeks that I had been away. I then made my first call to the police, blocking my caller ID. I told them that I was one of my neighbors and saw someone hanging around in their car in the alley behind my house and occasionally passing something through windows to passing cars while also looking into my yard and I was concerned that they were dealing drugs and or going to break into someone's property. I gave them his license plate and description. They said they would have someone there in a few minutes, so I thanked them and hung up. I then called Catherine and told her I was about 10 minutes from home and that I knew she was flying out tomorrow, but desperately wanted to surprise her. Looking back at the footage now, I laugh at the commotion that I am surprised I didn't hear. In a few short seconds, Harry was half-dressed and flying out the back door to his car. At that point, I couldn't have asked for a more perfect scene. As Harry was peeling away, one of the police cars rounded the corner behind me, saw Harry driving away fast, and gave chase. After pulling in, greeting an excited Catherine, and doing all the couple things, she fell asleep again. I, on the other hand, couldn't sleep a wink. The next day, her and her friends were bundled into a car. After they drove away, I had to wait a few hours but I began to execute my plan. I called my friend who was a removalist and apologized for the late notice, but needed my place packed and moved on Friday. After agreeing on a time, I told him that he would need to take certain boxes to a storage facility, which he said wasn't an issue. Then I began packing Catherine's belongings. Later that day, I got a call from the police for me to come and identify some property that they had apprehended from a suspect the previous night that fit the description of property I had reported stolen. I grinned to myself, happy that my plan for Harry had grown to fruition and replied that I would be there shortly to collect it. Of course, when I got there, some of the items were still unaccounted for due to the fact they must have still been in his house and they hadn't searched there yet. By this stage, the town was buzzing with news. Events in my hometown don't stay secret for long. Harry was disgraced and promptly fired for his possession of drugs and stolen property. And our respective bosses, on behalf of the company, had extended a formal apology towards me during the week. That night, I went to my parents' house and told both mine and Rachel's parents what happened, omitting certain details and that I was moving back to the city after being promoted, but Catherine wouldn't be a part of it. They were pretty upset initially that I hadn't let them know what was going on, but were happy that I was handling everything maturely and hadn't sunk to their level, though they didn't agree with ghosting Catherine. But after some drinks, laughs, and tears, I went home. On Friday afternoon, after a busy week of organizing cleaners for the following week, the real estate to put my house on the rental market, and various other tasks at my hometown's office, I packed some things into my car and drove to my parents' place and said goodbye before the drive. Before leaving, I went to Becky's house. Becky had been one of Rachel's closest friends growing up. She was the only other person who knew what was happening, minus the details about Harry. Without her help, I wouldn't have been able to organize everything as quickly as I had. I gave Becky a large manila folder with my gathered evidence of her cheating, as well as the letter and a few other legal documents from my attorney, stating that she was ordered not to contact me, and the details of how to access her belongings located at the storage unit I had rented out. After a quick goodbye, I left and drove back to the city. On Sunday, I woke up to several missed calls, voice messages, and text messages. Turns out, Catherine had come home early after being alerted to something being afoot in town, only to find an empty house and a for rent sign out the front. Freaking out, she had gone to my parents, who closed the door on her the moment that they answered, forcing her to call everyone until she managed to somehow be contacted by Becky and told that she had a package for her. I was told that she didn't take too well to that, as I fully well knew at that point from the numerous angry texts and voice messages from her accusing me of setting up Harry, of being deceitful, etc. I was worried that she might show up at my front door, but nothing ever happened. 
Five weeks later after leaving and being promoted, I write this out for you, dear reader. Granted, it's been long, and it took a few rewrites to shorten it down from my initial 14 pages, double what this story is now. But I feel that most of what I said is important enough for the story. Wow, what a story. Well, OP provided an edit down at the bottom. It says, So, am home now, and with the number of questions that are here, as well as other comments and messages I have received, I decided to take the time to answer questions and provide some clarity here, save responding to everyone. So, one of the questions I keep getting asked is what happened to Harry? Why I was so hard coming down on him, and why I would incriminate myself, especially on the internet. After making some inquiries back home to some friends, the short answer is, Harry is looking at a few months in prison, as it's his first offense, but could be out sooner, and I felt that it was necessary to the story. No one other than myself knew what I had planned to do with Harry, which is why I omitted quite a few crucial details that had the potential to truly identify me, as well as change up some of the descriptive language about locations to potentially put this story anywhere in the world. Just for clarification, there was already more than enough evidence in his own home, I just provided the means for the police to further investigate his activity in his home. That being said, I don't regret doing what I did to him, as he knew both Rachel and I growing up, and knew how hard it was for me to pick up my life after she died. For those also asking if I am worried about Harry finding out and pointing the authorities in my direction, I know that he doesn't use Reddit. I know Catherine has an account, but I haven't seen any recent activity to state that she has been online in some time. As for other Reddit users, who knows? Most of the people I am friends with on my main account may recognize this story if they come across it. But as for their browsing preferences outside of the subreddits that we frequent on, I can't say. As for Catherine, people have questioned why I didn't do more to her, or why I stuck around for as long as I did. Honestly, I almost did kick her out after a few days, but I wanted to gather evidence and show proof of her cheating, so that everyone she knew would know what she had done. She is a major socialite, her words, and I knew by exposing her, it would kill her reputation. As for what happened to her, I've been told that she moved to another state just recently after being transferred. From the people I have spoken to today, she was put mainly on administrative duties before her transfer, as there was quite a bit of backlash after the rumor mill made its way around town. People have questioned the legality of what I did to her, moving all her stuff out, sending her and some friends away, spending a good amount on the trip, etc. Morally, I can see that it's a pretty dick move to build up her expectations of what she thought was going to happen. This, combined with killing her status around town, was my ultimate goal to have her experience what it was like to have everything fall around you. But from a legal standpoint, I had every right. In the time she had been living with me, she had never updated any of her personal information, driver's license, voting registration, etc., to reflect that she had moved into my house. I found out this information during the course of my preparation with my lawyer after I spoke to r slash legal advice with no concrete proof on paper to show that she was residing there, and because we hadn't met the de facto status, I was able to do what I did with no threat of backlash. Now, this story is from two years ago, and OP did mention in the comments at that time that they were putting a lot of time in at work, and it was keeping them distracted for the most part. So, OP, over the past two years, I certainly hope life has turned around for you, and that everything is looking up. I can't imagine what it's like to lose family members the way that you have, and to be cheated on by people that you love, but I really hope that these experiences have made you a stronger person and that everything is going well now. Did you know we started back up the Karma Comic Chameleon podcast? It's now available on all major podcasting platforms. Just search out Karma Comic Chameleon. Our next story today comes to us from Rumpel 990 Scumbag does $2,000 damage to my car, steals my best friend's motorcycle while recovering from dental surgery, gets whole life destroyed for years. Let's jump right in. But first, let's meet the cast. There's me, best friend, and of course the star of the show, Scumbag. First, a little bit of background. There was this homeless, he wasn't truly homeless, Scumbag, who I was sheltering in my house while he looked for a place to stay. I wanted to help him out and help him back on his feet. He had been problematic for a while. He was crapping in the trash can, pissing in soda bottles everywhere, and lying to everyone all the time. 
He wasn't even good at lying. He was one of those pathological liars who can't tell the truth to save their life. And when he got a BB pew pew, he shot out my neighbor's window. This will become relevant at the end. The list of sketchy stuff Scumbag did could go on for days, but that's not what I'm writing this about, though it certainly does factor into the revenge. Now on to the main event. While one of my buddies needed a ride to the train station and I was too tired to drive, so I let him take my car and drive him to the train station. When he came back, my front bumper was on the ground and he duct taped it back on. He claimed that he was T-boned at an intersection and injured his leg. He went to the hospital, faked his injury, and came back with crutches so I'd buy it. When I asked the police in the town he said it happened in, whom he said he had filed a report with, they told me no such event had been reported, and they had no clue what I was talking about. I later found out through my buddy who was in the car with him that he was doing donuts in a parking lot and hit a tree. So shame on me for letting someone drive my car, I know. It was a very stupid decision on my part. The cost of repairing my car came out to be $2,000, and I couldn't get insurance to cover it, so the repairs came out of my pocket. So I gave him the benefit of the opportunity to make things right and said, all right, pay for the cost of the repairs and I'll forgive the transgression. He already had a minimum wage job, so I expected him to pay me every week until it was paid off. After two weeks, he stopped. So I took his PS3 and safe as collateral and said I'd give it back when he paid me back. And if he didn't, I'd sell it to cover the cost. A few weeks later, my best friend who was also staying with me had his wisdom teeth removed. He was in a ton of pain. That dental pain is the worst. Scumbag said he needed to go to the store. He let Scumbag take the bike to the grocery store, but after a while, we became suspicious. He called saying the bike wouldn't start. I drove over to the store he said he was at, and he and the motorcycle were nowhere to be found. The store was 10 minutes away. We called him and said, bring it back now or else we'll report it stolen. When he came back that evening with the girl, he made up a BS excuse as to why the motorcycle had 130 miles on the odometer. The way he told it made it clear he had no clue how mechanical odometers work. They don't glitch and jump ahead 130 miles like he said it did. My best friend would know he's constantly pulling his bike apart and making repairs and modifications to it. I grilled him about the fact that he was never where he said he was. We deduced that he had rode the bike to his hometown to pick up his girlfriend and back and lied about everything. That was the last straw that broke the camel's back and a very bad mistake. My best friend and I were trembling with rage when he threw him and his girl out the front door to the curb. This is where the nuclear revenge begins. Scumbag was dumb enough to leave all of his passwords saved on the laptop we loaned him while he was with us. We got his email and changed the password. Once you've got someone's email, you've got everything else by default. We got his social media accounts and financial accounts and reset their passwords too. It was hysterical seeing the flurry of password reset emails coming in. He knew we had him in the bag and was frantically trying to salvage his situation. He had opened a bank account at the local bank to deposit his paychecks from his local cashier job while he was in the area. We emptied the whole thing for a total of $2,500. Imagine my shock. I kept the $2,000 for my car and gave the remaining $500 to best friend for his troubles and having my back. We then sold his PS3 on Craigslist and split that 50-50. We eventually opened his safe and it was full of random papers and earbuds of no value, but it did have his debit card and one of the papers had his pin on it, which is how we emptied his bank account. In addition to that, while he's on the way out, I go to the store he was working at and tell his boss he won't be showing up this afternoon and to consider him to be quit. I explained why. The manager was cool about it but told me he can't take my word for it. In any event, he was never seen at that establishment again. So sooner or later, that manager was going to have to take my word for it. But we're not done yet. We still have a social life to destroy. We hijack his Facebook and make all of his friends hate him. We make posts about the crappy stuff he did. We make posts exclaiming his love of all manner of debauchery and degeneracy. We start petty fights with his friends list in the DMs. We go into their walls and say snarky, nasty crap. 
we turned everyone against him, and in the process of destroying his social life, a bunch of girls he abused and who lurked on his page came out of the woodwork praising us for taking him down a peg. It's been years and he still doesn't have social media presence. A few weeks go by and we get a package in the mail from him. Turns out he wasn't homeless and completely out of options like he said. Big surprise, I know. The package was mailed from his parents' house. It's an empty threat to sue me, overflowing with hilariously made-up lies and pages of screenshots of what we did to his social media. Me and best friend are laughing our butts off reading it. He said he left town because the bills were too much. He never did sue us, and we even taunted his bluff with our new Facebook account. The reason why he thought this would fly is the neighbor threatened to sue us over the window he broke, and we paid for the replacement window, so he thought that the mere threat of a lawsuit would be enough to put an end to the revenge. I still have his lawsuit letter, because I like to read it for a good chuckle every now and then. I'm thinking of framing it on my wall as a trophy. Last I heard, he's completely destitute and has zero friends now that everyone knows how much of a terrible person he is. Even his parents got sick of his manipulative behavior. His girlfriend didn't take long to wise up and apologize to us. So what's the real lesson of the story? Protect the ever-loving crap out of your email because that's all anyone needs to gain access to everything else you do and completely ruin you. Also, don't save your passwords on the computers of the people you're screwing over. Okay, so we know that this guy was a giant douchebag, but this story right here, it is a gigantic advertisement for two-factor authentication. It may not have been a thing back then, but it definitely is now. And if you're not using that on your main accounts like your email, you are an idiot. Somebody down in the comments for this one said, aren't all of these illegal? And uh, I guess they might have forgotten what subreddit they are in because this is nuclear revenge. If it wasn't illegal, it wouldn't have been posted here. Our next story today comes to us from throwaway1993-1424. Lady wouldn't vacate private parking space. Good luck finding your licenseless car in another country police impound lot. Let's jump right in. I have lived in an apartment complex in Lisbon, Portugal. The where is important for the last four years. If anyone's from here, you'll know parking is hell. Fortunately, my building has a private garage. However, as is often the case, some parking places are more difficult to park in than others. I have one of the easier ones. Last year, I was offered a job abroad and took it. Thought I'd be nice, parked my car at my parents where they have plenty of space, and left a notice in the building elevator that went along the lines of, I'm the owner of 3B and will be away for at least six months. Feel free to use my parking spot. Ended up being away for longer, almost a year. Came back to see my parking spot occupied, which was okay since I offered for it to be used. Put another notice in the elevator, this time to say I was back and would use the parking spot again. Gave it two days and picked up my car from my parents. Went into my garage and my space was still being used. Had to park somewhere on the street and decided to give it another day. The day after, it was occupied again by the same car. Asked a couple of neighbors and figured out it belonged to a lady living two stories above me. Went up to talk to her and she immediately got defensive and said that her parking spot is very difficult for her to park in and since I was away for longer than I had announced, I lost the space. Which is a stupid logic as the spots are bought with the apartment, it literally belongs to me. She also told me I couldn't use her parking space instead as she was using it for storage. Went to the building admin who said he'd talk to her, he did, and came back shaking his head. Nothing. I sent a registered letter telling her to stop using my space and giving her 48 hours to take her car elsewhere. The next day, I saw the unopened letter in the garbage bin beside the mailboxes. I ended up scouting my garage, waiting for her to leave, and would immediately park my car, hoping she'd take the hint. She didn't, and we ended up doing this dance for a few weeks, up until the day I came back to see my entire driver's side keyed. That was the final straw. I talked to a friend who owns a towing company. We chose a Saturday morning, the last few weeks she hadn't left home on Saturdays. I knew as I had been watching her car like a hawk. So I thought we'd have big chances of her not noticing anything until everything was done and towed her car. The plan initially was to leave the car just down the road, but that felt too close and too easy. 
Then, I thought about leaving it in a city about 15 minutes away, but it still didn't feel quite right. My friend jokingly said, let's leave it in Madrid. FYI, Madrid is in Spain, about 600 kilometers, 375 miles away. I knew he was joking, but Madrid did feel right. I asked if he had enough time. He had, so off we went. Once we got to Madrid, we went out for lunch, strolled around the city, and waited until it got dark and the streets empty. In the meantime, we had already decided on where to leave the car, a handicapped parking spot close to a police station. And so we did. As a bonus, my friend also took both license plates off the car. Then we drove back home. It has been two weeks and I haven't seen her car since. One of these days, I might leave a letter in her mailbox telling her to contract Madrid police. But in the meantime, I'll enjoy being able to use my parking whenever I want to. Ah yes, here we have the elusive Karen, who doesn't understand that the world doesn't revolve around them. I've gotta say for this one though that Karen's gonna know exactly who made the car disappear. And while it's fun to put it in a completely different country so far away, you probably just should have had it towed normally and sitting in an impound lot where she could pay a fine to get it back out. Those fines are pretty steep and might help her change her mind on parking in your spot. Our next story today comes to us from Bitsley. Steal from me, I'll ruin your career. Let's jump right in. This was about two years ago in college. I had just moved into a house off campus with three of my closest friends. There were two other college guys already living there. All of these guys were doing Air Force ROTC with me. Basically, you go into the military after you graduate. I really liked all of my roommates and the house, except for one of the dudes that was already living there. He had a dog that would constantly rip up, piss, crap on the carpet, and he wouldn't clean it up. Furthermore, he would yell at us for leaving dirty dishes in the sink, etc., while he was the one making the vast majority of the mess. I had a job working around 30 hours a week and doing school full-time and doing ROTC. I had a job as a server, so I would make quite a lot of tips, around $300 a week. I would leave the cash in my room boxed up because I trusted everyone in the house. We were all going to join the military, and integrity is a big thing. So I go to deposit my tips in the bank after not going for about a month, and I'm shocked when my cash deposit is only about $200, when I knew it had to be at least $1,200. I knew someone was stealing my tips then. It then made sense because my deposits had seemed a little low for a while. I was furious because I was barely scraping by working my butt off trying to pay for college. So I buy a security camera for my room and hide it. I get all the documents from my work regarding the tips I've made over the past few months. I continue leaving my tips in the box unconcealed as bait. I don't tell any of my roommates this. Sure enough, I leave for a trip and I get a notification on my phone. I watch as this mofo that I trusted steals about $300 in cash from me, taking only $20 bills so I wouldn't notice. Well, the next day back from the trip, I schedule a meeting with our ROTC commander. I bring him all the evidence and video footage and tell him about my awful experiences with him in my house, with my other roommates as witnesses. Long story short, he got kicked out of ROTC and ruined his career. He had to pay me back about $1,000. I let him off easy and had to pay the military back about $9,000. He had been getting paid by them for about a year. In addition, we go to an expensive school and he chose a useless major, so he is stacked high in student debt with no real way out. And finally, he had just quit his job because he thought he could get away with stealing from me and watching TV at home. And he had just crashed his dream car he had been working on for a while because he drives like an idiot. I still see him every so often on campus and smile at him. He must have been doing this for a really long time taking those tips from you if he thought that he could quit his job and live off of them. That also means that he would have been stealing quite a large amount. Like Opie said that it was $300 when he was caught on camera. If he was taking amounts that high before, Opie, how the heck did you not notice that? Anyway, what do you guys think about it? I'd love to see your comments down below. Our next story today comes to us from East Pianist 2731 I put my first job out of business after eight years working there. Let's jump right in. 
Okay, so I live in a relatively small city in North Carolina and started working at the young age of 14 as a dishwasher, soon working my way up through the restaurant over two years. Settle in, because this is a long one and I hope you all enjoy it. The original owner of the restaurant and bar, a 50-plus-year-old woman, had grown interest in selling the restaurant after 10 years of great reviews, and honestly, it became the best place in town to go to. A younger male walked in one day through the kitchen door. In the start, I thought he was a new employee. Finding out later that night, he was the one interested in buying the restaurant, and the sale went smoothly. Fast forward a year, and the new owner, let's call him Herb, denied the only time I had ever asked for a raise. The $7.50 an hour I started on was not a living wage. He told me I didn't work hard enough. When I had gone as far as to wait on tables and cook, as well as many of the cleanup, maintenance, on top of my job of being their dishwasher. Thankfully for me, at the time, my manager, who had listened through the office door, called him out on the BS. She got me my raise. Nonetheless, a few months into it, Herb let several coolers which had meat break down and refused to fix them or get a new one. My nice manager couldn't take getting the backlash of always being blamed for things breaking down. Herb's the owner, it was his money, he had to approve anything we did. So on the night we celebrated her 10 year anniversary of working there, she ate the cake my sister and I made her. Then also proceeded to quit on the spot right after. The responsibility of management fell onto my sister, and she was forced to take the promotion with no raise or anything. She managed for 9 months, only to feel unheard. For any issue she brought up with equipment or workers, she would always be told, no, we cannot do that. And after she had had enough, trying to convince him on repairs, we were left without a manager for a period of time. And he was forced to drive the three hours to come and manage the restaurant himself. A few weeks after, a new manager was hired, and another man was hired to be my help in the kitchen. And me, being the head cook at this point in time, I taught him the ups and downs of the kitchen. And this man, he was kind and caring at first. But he kissed butt so much that I was overlooked for the kitchen manager position. The guy I love to watch football with in the kitchen on my phone, using my speaker on the slow Sundays, changed into a brutal butthead. He would cuss at the waitresses and try to physically fight me on the daily. He and I were there to open the kitchen alone, and we'd be joined by waitstaff an hour later. He went as far as to buck up to try to fight one of the waitresses one day. When she mentioned she had heard everything he said to me before she walked in, I am done with your crap. You can either apologize or you can get the F out. OP has been here a lot longer than you and you were trained by him. And yet you think you can disrespect him? Hell no. As the man raised his hand to try to smack her, I punched him in his face and in return got slammed into the already broken coolers. You do not hit a woman, ever. Fast forward a few months later, and after everyone sees this side of him, they realize I wasn't playing about him being a grade A dick. Many of us had tried to tell Herb about his actions, but were met with, it can't be that bad, he's so nice. Finally, after not being heard or listened to for so long, I began planning how to quit. I had it all planned out, and when we had the meeting, I walked in in a suit, already having found a place with, at that time, my fiancé, and a new job far from my home. Everyone knew I was overdressed and had questions, and I filled them in on the walkout plan, yet the mean manager was nowhere in sight. After enjoying the meeting and being called on for my opinions on how to boost sales and better the restaurant, I looked at Herb and answered sarcastically, Oh, me? Now you want to hear what I have to say? Getting in a serious tone now, I stand up and told him, why would I help a business, much less the owner of this business, better themselves when I have been blown off for months? Anything I had to tell you, I was bullied for months and when I mentioned it, I was brushed off. Have a great effing day, Herb, because you quite literally don't have a cook now. Today is moving day and I'm moving over four hours away to a better job. One with an owner who will listen and respect their workers and not force us to try and cook green slimy chicken past its expiration date. I quit. He begged for me to stay because he had finally fired the mean manager. He said, is there any possible way I can get you to stay? I looked at him and repeated the words he always told us when we mentioned equipment needed repaired or replaced. 
in his exact customer support accent. No, we can't do that. As I walked out, he followed begging me to stay and said he finally did what was needed of him. I simply told him, too little, way too late and proceeded to walk out. And what followed was all the coworkers on my side stood up and left too. This is not where it ends. He had purposefully not given me my W-2 forms for taxes, and after a few days of harassing him for my tax papers, I got them. Then, I received a letter from the IRS stating there was a problem with my tax forms, therefore I couldn't receive my tax refund. Calling up the IRS, I found he had not submitted any of the forms he was supposed to as our employer, and when contacting him to rectify the situation, he proceeded to say, Hmm, I don't recall employing any of you this year. After all, you all left with no reason or right. Little did he know I record every conversation on my phone, and I reported him to the IRS. Attached to the email, I sent in the voice recording in an MP3 format, and I also sent in photocopies of my check stubs and copies of my W-2s, along with informing my coworkers having issues with their taxes to do the same. Herb has since lost his business, his business license, his wife left him and took their kids after finding out about his fraud. Herb is now facing upwards to 60 years in prison for multiple counts of tax fraud. It turns out we were not the only business he owned and refused to pay taxes or file the correct tax forms when needed. He had withheld the safety precaution pay during COVID and used all of it to fix the restaurant. He effed up and I get to sit back happily typing this with a smile knowing this peckerhead got what was coming to him. For all of you wondering whether I ever got my taxes and my money, yes, I finally did as of yesterday. Thanks for listening to my life story guys. So this was the cleaned up version of this story because the original one was written with barely any periods in the whole thing. Like I think through all of the paragraphs, there might have been three of them. <laughs> in the comments, the validity of the story was called into question, but OP messaged one of the people in the comments and gave them actual screenshots and photos that actually made that person say, okay, I got the pictures, they're convincing, OP's telling the truth. OP also mentioned that they don't let people walk all over them anymore. A little bit of experience like this with a crappy manager can really make you realize what's happening when you go to different jobs in the future and make you want to stand up for yourself. Our next story today comes to us from Meltdown. Parking spot stealing douche waffle gets his Lexus set on fire. Let's jump right in. Well, not as nuclear as some stories I've read, proportionate to the crime, I'd say this counts. Set the Wayback Machine to the year 2000. I'm living in a crappy apartment over a storefront, so parking was limited. Now, this was the middle of winter, and I didn't have a car at that period in my life, but my girlfriend at the time did. She was coming over in a couple hours, and finding parking on the street is a gamble, so I wanted to dig out a parking spot for her out of the snowbank in the alley behind my building. I didn't own a snow shovel, so using a hammer, old plastic ice cream bucket, and my bare hands, I dug out a chunk about 3 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters to make room for her to park. I don't know if you can appreciate how much snow that is, but it was a lot of work, especially considering my lack of proper equipment. This isn't fresh fallen snow either, this is a snowbank packed by a plow, practically ice. But whatever, we do crazy things for love, right? But apparently, I had too much faith in humanity. I thought the cardboard sign I left in the newly cleared parking spot that said, I spent an hour and a half digging this out for someone specific, please do not park here, would be enough. Nope, wouldn't be writing this if it had been. Naturally, some thunder sea of a Lexus owner threw the sign in the dumpster and stole the spot. I remember it was red. I was going to post a link to a pic of a car that resembles it, but a, I see the rules prohibit this, and B, it's kind of irrelevant anyway. I hadn't told my girlfriend about my plan to dig out the parking spot, mostly because I didn't want to look like a wuss if it was too much work and I gave up. So I just stewed on it, imagining all the things I could do. My girlfriend ended up finding a spot on the street a block away, and we had a good evening anyway. She had to work the next day, so she took off around 2am, and I stayed up until maybe around 4am. The car was still there, and I was still pissed. By this time, all the bars were closed. The neighbors were asleep, and the streets were quiet. Couldn't ask for a better opportunity to ruin someone's crap. 
I went outside with a bottle of anhydrous isopropanol I kept around as a solvent, doused the car's tires, and set them on fire. I nabbed the cardboard sign from the dumpster and used it to quickly scrape the snow and cover my tracks, then took it back inside with me. No point leaving evidence behind. Over the course of the next few minutes, I heard bang, kapow, blam, boom, as the tires burst one by one. I had honestly expected the whole car to go up in flames, but each burst was apparently forceful enough to put out each individual tire, as well as blast out a sizable divot in the snowpack. Nothing happened until the next day, but police were eventually called. They were knocking on doors, asking if anyone saw something. Nope, sorry, must have slept right through it. Good luck, officer. Hope you catch the guy. I turned on my police scanner to keep tabs on things, mostly out of fear of getting caught. But there were no witnesses, and I learned the owner only had liability insurance. What kind of idiot buys a Lexus but not full coverage? I would soon find out. When I went outside to survey my handiwork under the guise of taking up the trash and being a curious resident, oh man yeah, that guy was going to need to get his whole car resprayed. The car looked fine structurally, but I did probably more than two grand worth of cosmetic damage, not to mention needing four new tires. I also got a look at the guy who owned the car, and the image I had created in my head of what a person would look like that would so unapologetically steal someone's hard work was completely accurate. He was grade A, first class, board certified, textbook douchebag. Orange fake tan, way too much hair product, leather pants, weapons grade douchery, a decade before Jersey Shore was a thing. I regret nothing. Never saw that car again, got away scot-free. OP left a couple of edits on this one. The first one says, and as expected with every story, you get the legions of people trying to poke holes in it, saying things like, alcohol doesn't burn hot enough, yada yada yada. Well, guess what? Apparently it does, because we had a Lexus with four pop tires. I'm not sure if the tires actually caught fire, or if the heat of the flame just caused the pressure to go up to the point that the tires burst. All I know is I lit four tires on fire with 100% isopropyl alcohol, and four tires popped. If someone wants to do the math and figure it out, fine. Edit 2, to address some further comments, it was indeed a small bottle of isopropanol, no larger than 1 liter. It wasn't like I made sure to thoroughly saturate the tires, I was aiming to get in and out without getting caught. It was like blub blub, move on to the next, blub blub, move on to the next, etc. I smoked at the time, so I either lit the fires with a cardboard match or a simple cheap butane lighter, I don't remember which. But those were my main cigarette lighting tools, so it would have been one of those. I probably went with the butane lighter, but again, that's a detail I simply don't recall specifically. Again, I seriously thought the tires would catch fire, and the whole car would end up torched, but for whatever reason, the four tires popped, and that plus some smoke damage and bubbled paint was the extent of it. And in a final angry edit, OP said this, Yes, this happened. Anyone who says it's not possible is objectively empirically wrong. It happened. I was there. I know. But whatever. It's a story from almost two decades ago. It's past the statute of limitations for property damage. And frankly, I just don't give an F at this point. You're free to disbelieve it and be wrong if you want. Whatever. The story does sound a little sketchy to me, even though OP goes to great lengths to tell us that it's true at the end. They spent an hour digging out this spot, and they left a sign saying that they did. If this guy read the sign and told the police that, all they have to do is find one witness that saw him digging out the snow in that hour and a half that they were out there. Maybe OP just got lucky and the sign blew away, and then somebody picked it up and put it in the dumpster, and it wasn't even the guy driving the Lexus. That would be extremely lucky. Our next story today comes to us from Totes Magoats 33 Supervisor takes credit for my work, I cause entire production to shut down. Let's jump right in. I started working in a machine shop after I finished school with a two-year degree in machining. Learned all kinds of programming techniques that could make most machines that were less than 30 years old perform moves and output measurements of parts currently in the machine to automatically perform quality control. This greatly increases quality of parts as well as reduces waste and human error. I also learned many tricks along the way to make sure that my work could not be stolen. It's my first day on the machine shop floor, 
and I immediately noticed inefficiencies in all the machines at my station. We had to manually perform quality control, sacrificing production time, while also leaving tons of room for human error due to the poor quality of measuring instruments in the shop. I'm new and eager to prove I'm worth more than the original pay they offered. I told my supervisor to let me spend an hour to add a line of code to a machine to demonstrate my skills I learned in school that would immediately cut scrap and waste down by a large portion, without slowing production rates on the line. My immediate supervisor humored me thinking I was BSing him to try and brown nose the engineers and lead programmers so I could get brownie points or something. Quick backstory to note, I had zero experience in a production plant and said supervisor had 30 years experience in the field. He had a very proud attitude and genuinely worked very hard to learn what he knew. He was decent to work with, but when I asked questions about some of the basics on this machine, like how to get to the program so I could edit it, he would block my view of what he was doing and get to the end result quickly without explaining the process. Being new and wanting to learn, I'd always ask to have him show me what he did. He always refused and claimed it was his way of securing his job. Anyway, I programmed the function into the main machine in about 2 hours 40 minutes. And when it comes time to demonstrate the process, it catches a part that is out of tolerance according to the blueprint. I also programmed the machine to output different messages, providing instructions to whoever the operator was on ways to resolve the issue if the part couldn't be salvaged, or to automatically adjust offsets of the tool that machined the feature that was found to be out of tolerances, and rerun said operation and recheck said feature to ensure quality. All of these functions were performed automatically without any input from an operator. This is a pretty magnificent feature to have in production, and my supervisor knew that. The supervisor who observed the demo immediately went to report this to higher-ups, who came to view the new feature I had implemented. As the next part was being produced, the quality check move initiated and found that the second part was also bad, and output a message to change tools X, Y, and Z. The managers were incredibly surprised that this was all done on an 18-year-old machine, and they looked to my supervisor to ask how he figured it out. Long story short, he took the credit and was given a raise on the spot. It didn't register to me that that's what happened until I went to ask if he was going to credit me for my work. He said, yeah, but you gotta put in the time to get where I'm at. It don't matter that you did the job, cause without me, you never would have known how to do your fancy programming in the first place. The managers had left for the day, so I couldn't fight my case right then. The next day, I was planning on informing the managers that I was the one who did the programming to do that. The managers were also former machine shop veterans with 20 plus years in the workplace and refused to believe me. Not only that, they basically yelled at me for trying to steal credit from someone who has worked their way up in the company and learned everything on their own and not from some school. I went to my station even more pissed now, where I was met by my supervisor. He told me that I needed to go around to all the machines that could perform that function and add it to the code. I said, not without a raise. My code saves you guys tons and brings the bottom line to a level that McDonald's qualified workers could produce infinite numbers of parts with minimal loss. He said if I didn't do it, I would be fired. So I faked my compliance and started to change code on all the machines. If you know anything about programming, you know you can make something function a certain way until a certain value is met, and then have it completely change afterwards. This was my job security. So I set the quality check up on 18 machines the first day, then the last 30 that weekend, and the managers were praising the supervisor uncontrollably for his innovation. Well, the programs were all set to operate as normal and do quality checks like I programmed the original machine. However, I programmed the rest of the machines to keep track of a new variable. They would run and self-check just fine until they reached a random number of parts produced, 50 to 500, depending on the production time of the parts run on each machine, where it would then throw up an error code that would only be cleared with a password I had set for it. If a wrong password was provided or someone just hit the enter or reset button, the machine would take its largest tool in the turret and run it rapidly into the solid chunk at maximum RPMs. I made it so about 65 to 75 hours of production would go smoothly before my job security would kick in. 
It took three days for the machines to hit their magic values, but when they did, boy oh boy, was it magically satisfying. The first machine to crash was making parts for the drive lines of a major motor company. The crash was caused while a new operator was running the machine, who I might add was only hired because the program I made let them hire clueless people into the shop and be able to still produce good parts. When he tried to clear my password code, the lathe started turning at 2500 RPMs with a large heavy drive shaft base in the holder, switched to a huge drill, and ran the drill into the holder, causing the tool holder to be knocked off axis, the part holder and tools to be destroyed, as well as costing the company tons to get someone from the machine's maintenance team out to repair it. After the first glorious crash, I menacingly mentioned to the supervisor, you should check your codes to make sure they're working properly. He went ghost white, not a second after, three more machines simultaneously crash in glorious fashion. He starts to chew me out, saying I'm in huge trouble. But as he starts cursing, the managers are there to have him go diagnose the problems with his codes. The supervisor, not wanting to admit he stole my work, doubles down and says confidently, I know what the problem is, and walks off to the crashed machines. Not a minute after they turn a corner, more machines start crashing. I just sit idly by and listen to the glorious sounds of my nuclear revenge playing out. A few minutes later, all the workers are told to stop production completely. We are all kept in the shop until they can figure out the problems. This is a 24-hour production facility with three shifts of workers coming in seven days a week, mind you. Our shift is nearly over, and we've all been idle for about seven hours. The next shift comes in, and we leave for the day. I hear nothing from the shop, so I just go in the next day as normal. Turns out, they tried to fire machines back up during the night shift, and 18 more machines crashed like the others. The plant did a formal layoff of most of the workers the next week, as they were hemorrhaging money from all the damaged machines on top of labor paid without any production. We filed a class action suit against the company for unemployment, lost vacation time, dangerous work conditions due to the severity of the crashes, etc. The company went bankrupt from the lawsuits and losses in production and machine repairs. The guy who took my credit was obviously fired and had an article in the paper about him sabotaging the company's production. He obviously told them I was responsible for the crashes, but the company found out that the password to the code program was his name. They believed he did this out of spite because he was refused a raise the previous year and his threats to them after his last evaluation. Sucks to suck, ha <laughs> OP left an edit at the bottom of this one. It says, to all in the comments worried about the innocent workers, they were given two months severance pay on top of being able to collect unemployment for 16 weeks. The severance pay outlined by the lawsuit took into account all the benefits the employees had before getting laid off. I do feel guilty that there was collateral damage. However, most of the employees ended up with the equivalent of about six months paid vacation. So there was a happy ending. I honestly didn't think the company would continue to try and run these machines when all the ones that my supervisor took claim to programming were crashing. That was their fault and greed, trying to make money instead of fixing the problems before continuing production. This supervisor was a dumb butt. Who in their right mind is going to royally screw over somebody who has changed the code on the machines that you need to do your job? Idiot. While I feel sorry for all the innocent people that lost their jobs in this case, I do remember that we're reading from Nuclear Revenge and, well, <laughs> that's just the way things go. Our next story today comes to us from Wafer 2016, The Office Pervert and a Cribbage Championship. Let's jump right in. Hello, happy internet people. This might not be quite pro, but it definitely isn't petty, so here goes. I used to work in an office that did promotions for local charity events and fundraisers. Crap pay, but awesome coworkers, and the blueberry scones in the office cafe were flat out amazing. Our office was small as offices go, about 20 employees including the two managers. Our top boss, who I will call Bob, was really sweet. Constantly having friendly contests with prizes for the most donations and such, I won a basketball that I donated to the kids in my church, haha. <laughs> he was the kind of guy that would give you $20 from his own pocket if you needed lunch money. I miss him, but I digress. 
our office was a lot like the TV show. We were a close family of sorts who celebrated each other's birthdays, drew names at Christmas, and ate lunch together. All was rainbows and flowers until Steve strode into our happy kingdom of blissful sunshine. Steve was tall. Steve was large. Steve had a thing for girls with big chests. Steve had been fired from the hospital morgue for having relations with the, um, the deceased. Into Steve's line of vision came my friends and myself, the three girls in the office whose attributes appealed to him. Day one, Steve sidled over to our end of the office and leered at us. Hey ladies, staring at our chests. We mumbled, shifted, and went back to work. No problem, right? Oh, how wrong you are. This began a daily onslaught of touching, rubbing, comments, stroking our hair, lewd remarks, and pouting because we didn't reciprocate. We went to Bob. We went to second manager. They threatened him. It continued. Until the day I was on the phone with a client and he grabbed my arm in a vice and started whispering in my ear while I was talking to the client. I was struggling to stay professional while trying and failing to get away from him. I finally hung up and screamed, let go of me, while bursting into tears. Now, this was the 90s. Recognition for sexual harassment was still in its infancy. Help for it was almost non-existent, unless you worked in our office. <laughs> Second manager came roaring over, hauling Steve off me and making sure I was okay. Told me to take the rest of the day. The revenge and surprising outcome. I went home and took the next day as well to settle my nerves. When I returned to work, the office was buzzing. The girls gathered around me asking if I knew what had happened after I left. Nope. The guys in our office gathered in the hall and waited for Steve. When he came out for a smoke, they jumped him, pinned him up against the wall, and while I was never privy to what was said, I was let know they beat him pretty good and put the fear of God in him. Steve didn't return for a few days. When he came back, he was a broken man. Black eye, bruised face. He came up to me and loudly apologized, saying he knew how wrong he was and promised to play nice from then on. The outcome. Steve was a changed man. Turns out, he was actually a pretty decent guy. While eating lunch one day, someone brought a cribbage board and everyone was surprised to learn I didn't know how to play, so Steve offered to teach me. I found I loved the game, and Steve and I quickly became the team to beat, going on to win the office championship. I left there a few years later. When I left, everyone chipped in for gifts and cards, and Steve gave me a hug. I hugged him back. Ah yes, your co-workers gave him a little bit of attitude adjustment therapy, although with his history, it does make me wonder if he was just putting on a show at work from then on and was still just up to his regular hijinks when he wasn't surrounded by people that could kick his butt, and I guess now he knows what it feels like when someone grabs him without his consent. I thank you for watching, I hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.